speaker will be Lance Bosar. Um, Lance also gave a talk at the colloquium. So um, thanks again, Lance, whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm doing this at Rob Favell's house because there was a massive internet failure at my house about an hour and a half ago. Naturally, <laughs> the atmosphere knows what I was up to or not up to as the case may be. All right. So I'm going to talk about- um, It's not yet in full screen lens, sorry. Um, it's... I always forget to do that. I always forget something. Um, it's the one next to the sliding. Um, Wait a minute, hold it yeah, there. Here, this one, yeah. There we go. Okay, um, first of all, I wanna um, thank you and Judith for putting on this remarkable colloquium. Having done this, I know how just how much work it is, especially behind the scenes to make it work. I also wanna acknowledge um, my co-authors, two of them are students in the colloquium, Tyler Light and Alex Mitchell, and another Albany graduate student, Ming Hao Chow. All right, so I want to talk about the contributions of recurving East Pac and West Pac tropical cyclones to an extreme weather event over the Western Conus in September uh, 2020. And the event in question is, well, it had a lot of California wildfires and antecedent conditions and widespread drought. So this, was a, this is becoming a regular occurrence on the West Coast, but this was quite the event last year. Um, and if we look at, say, the water, some of the uh, patterns that that led up to this uh, the, was the trough off the shore that allowed moisture from mid levels to reach the west coast, and steep lapse rates that favored dry thunderstorms with lots of lightning. So in California, it was the 30 driest August in 126 years in through here. And you look at the western Kona's vapor pressure deficit is near the hundredth percentile pretty much everywhere. The monsoon season this year is sure different than um, than last summer. So what do recurving and transitioning Western Pacific tropical cyclones have to do with everything in through here? Well, um, they lead to downstream baroclinic development and, in this case, deep dateline trough formation, upper level ridging in eastern Alaska and Western Canada, surface anticyclogenesis over southwest Canada that drove the uh, easterly flow to the coast and uh, strong sea level pressure rises across the Great Basin. Um, and the, and the strong west coast easterly flow. And there was eventually a big cold outbreak that followed the heat wave. So everything was happening all at once. All right, there were three uh, West Pac TCs in particular, Bavi, Masek, and Hai Shen um, in there. And they all were moving mostly northward. And these are the kinds of TCs that you have to pay attention to because as they move northward, they can perturb the, uh, the North Pacific jet stream and that can lead to downstream baroclinic development. So I'm going to show you some overview maps first. Um, we're going to look at it from a dynamic tropopause perspective on the two potential vorticity unit surface. And we'll look at PV and the 300 to 200 hectopascal irrotational wind and 250 millibar winds. Uh, Takeaway from these maps is going to be that Westpac T seeds perturb the downstream flow. And the maps I'm going to show you are courtesy of Heather Archambault. So here's the first one at 12Z in the August, 26th of August, 2012. The dynamic, we're going to see a, these dynamic tropopause maps. Um, the colors, the warm colors, the higher potential temperature. So here's the TC right in here. Here's the trough to the west. And then you see this big anticyclonic mushroom type cloud. This is the impact of anticyclonic wave breaking when a TC interacts with a mid latitude baroclinic trough. That was Bavi. Uh, here's May 2nd, 0Z the 3rd, uh, September. You again see. Uh, the trough to the west, the TC is in here, um, and here's Hai Shen coming in, coming in to join the party. Uh, trough negatively tilted trough to the west. These are the winds on the dynamic tropopause, and again a big anticyclonically curved outflow, and with a further downstream trough. So if we go now to TC Hai Shen on the seventh of September at zero zero Z, this is getting to look old. Another trough to the west of the TC as the TC interacts with the trough. Big anticyclonically curved uh, outflow, uh, way break, anticyclonic way breaking, and a downstream trough. So it, instead, if we look at, go back and look at now the PV, the 250 millibar winds, and the 300 to 200 millibar hectopascal irrotational wind vectors. So the solid contours are PV, and the wind vectors are the irrotational winds on the, the three to 200 millibar layer. The red areas are 
asset in the six to 400 millibar layer. So this is the weakest storm. This is the BAVI in through here, but notice the PV max is up here. BAVI is in here. Uh, note that there's negative PV advection by the irrotational wind, which is helping to build the ridge. Uh, now we look at MASEC. Again, it's a stronger TC. You can see the upstream trough here. Uh, here's May, uh, MASEC right here. The upstream trough, it's interacting the trough, but note the strong negative PV advection by the irrotational wind, which is contributing to the ridge building. Now in a rerun, here's Haishen four days later. Um, these are identical. This is just the Western one is in the left one is in the Western Pacific, and this is the North Pacific. So you can see the downstream impacts. Again, strong negative uh, divergent outflow from the irritational wind, and that is being driven by latent heat release. So that's the connection between, between the, the perturbation to the PV waveguide and the deep tropical moisture associated with the tropical storm. And here's the same thing down here, but further east, and you can see the effect of the downstream vericlinic development you have this big deep trough building the ridge on the off um, along the west coast, and again with negative PV advection by the irrotational wind and strong divergent outflow. So the takeaways from that part: recurving west pack TCs perturb the westerlies and induce downstream baroclinic development. Negative PV advection by the irrotational wind further assists downstream baroclinic development and ridge building. And if you don't get the moisture distribution right and you don't have the vertical distribution of diabatic heating properly done, um, your forecast is going to uh, contain a lot of errors. OK, but wait, there's more. East Pack TCs joined the party. So we had poleward moving and weakening East Pack TCs, Elida, Fosto, and Genevieve in August 2020. Um, there are the tracks in through here. But the East Pack TCs are different. They're typically weakening uh, uh, TCs. They're not like the category three and category four ones in the Western Pacific. And so the tendency is to dismiss them because they weaken the colder sea surface temperatures. And as they get away from the, from the warmer sea surface temperatures, they tend to weaken. But um, they have other impacts in terms of moisture. So what I call trough off the coast pattern between the 8th and 21st of August, 2020. So look, look, let's look at some mean uh, 500 millibar height for this period on the top. Anomaly on the bottom, on the right-hand column is precipitable water, anomaly on the bottom. So you see there's a big ridge over the western part of the United States. Um, the uh, core of the anomaly is over Nevada, Northern California, and Southern Oregon in here, a trough offshore. So there's anomalous southeasterly flow. Um, that will help facilitate moisture, poleward moisture advection from those recurving Eastern Pacific tropical uh, cyclones. Uh, in the terms of the precipitable water anomalies, uh, positive anomalies almost everywhere along the California coast and offshore, big negative anomalies, you might imagine, with the, with the heat wave and the ridge and the very dry air inland. So here's a, so the effect of the offshore anomalous trough um, in there and the track of the anomalous of the, of the tropical cyclones up the coast. Now, what does that do indirectly? It's not like a category one TC, but watch what happens. And this is the case of the first one, Fausto, in here. So you can see the moisture, if we play this, wait again, notes how the moisture is streaming poleward into California, mid-level moisture in Northern and Central California. And what is that gonna do? It's gonna support some uh, elevated convection. So if we look at the North Pacific flow evolution subsequent to the recurvature of those three Eastern Pacific TCs, and we have it in a loop in through here in the Pacific, and now you can see the effect of the TCs. You can see how the jet amplifies in the downstream trough and ridge builds on the left-hand side. It, um, the thickness is there, 250 millibar winds. On the right side is the right-hand side is the 500 millibar flow. And you can see towards the end, the big here, the, as the big ridge, as the TCs, as the whole pattern flow pattern amplifies, now here and leading to this big ridge on the west coast. And then a trough drops down to the east. That was the subsequent cold wave during that period. So here's an intermediate synopsis of, of the TCs. Um, the recurving West Pack TCs induce downstream flow amplification, mid Pacific trough, and an Alaska North, Northwest Canada ridge. Decaying poleward moving East Pack TCs enable mid level tropical moisture to reach Northern California and Oregon. The tropical mid level moisture fuels outbreaks of dry lightning storms that sparks an outbreak of wildfires. So let's look briefly look at some mid, at some impacts in here. 
Um, there's this spectacular image of uh, lightning over the Bay Bridge, Oakland, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Bridge. This is a very unusual site for mid-August. Um, and here, um, here's a radar lightning loop um, in California showing all the lightning and the, and the convective cells. You would think it'd be a lot of rain reaching the surface, but it, but it wasn't um, in there. And here's like the lightning complexes that on there, the, the lightning and the storm fire complexes on the left and on the right. Um, they have the tracks of the uh, lightning, cloud to grout lightning during this period. So over very dry soil, that's that mid-level moisture, which is supporting that. And these are what was going on. Wildfire spread by, uh, by flying embers. And I love this image because this is, this is taken by the Reno uh, uh, National Weather Service Doppler radar. Here's the California Nevada border here. So you're looking west. Here you, you have an anticyclonic tornado flow away from the radar towards the radar in through here likely fire tornado, according to noted by the uh, radar operator in there. And there's a ground truth verification of the anticyclonic tornado um, at the same time. That is just a spectacular image. So now let's look at the, during the ridge building on the Western Conus Ridge building in through here. This is 12Z in August. You're gonna see some maps that look like this. Sea level pressure as in solid, uh, 1,005 thickness dec decameters in, in red and blue. Um, and then precipitable water is the grayscale shading. So back on the 12th of August in through here, you can see some of the moisture sort of sneaking up. Here's the first of the TCs um, in there. And that's Alita, then the remnant moisture in through here. This will be Fausto coming in, draw off, off the West Coast. Here comes the next one um, in there. So that's remnant of Genevieve, again, with the weak trough off, off the West Coast. The moisture sneaks up along the coast at mid-levels, but it's not enough to to produce, and this is all remnant from the tropical cyclones, but it just goes into the ridge building with the trough offshore in through here, 28th of August in there. And then you can see what we described earlier as the big ridge builds in through here um, at this time, ridging and subsidence, that's a result of the recurving Western Pacific tropical cyclones. And as that ridge, whoops, and as that ridge builds, you can see the ridge poking its way into the Pacific Northwest and you get the easterly flow gradient to the south, and that's driving the uh, wildfires towards the, towards the coast. Now then there was a, a cold surge that followed, um, and so we look at some standardized, uh, standardized anomaly maps for this period. On the left is the 500 millibar height, st uh, height and standardized anomalies. On the right is the 850 millibar heights and uh, uh, black contours, and the temperatures are dash red contours, and that standardized height, standardized 850 millibar temperatures on the right, standardized 500 millibar temperature on the left. You can see you're looking at three and four sigma ridge here on the 6th of September. Um, all, all across the Western United States, it's very anomalously warm between two and three sigma standardized anomalies. So as we go through one day later, look how, I'll go back, watch how the ridge builds in this final act from the last of the Pacific, Western Pacific typhoons, tracking it, uh, pushing it up, it folds over, trough deepens on the east as the ridge folds over and as the clonic wave breaking tries to get going, the trough drops down the eastern side and then it comes down across the Great Basin bringing a um, significant cold spell to that area. And then we can look at it here in loop mode on the left, sea level pressure, 1,005 thickness and 250 millibar winds. And on the right, 700 millibar heights, uh, precipitable water is shaded and what temperatures are in dash red contour. But you can see in the 700 millibar circulation, and when it reloops in through here, northerly flow circulation comes down um, in there. Moist, the moisture is, di is dire directed to the east of the continental divide. All right, this is remarkable. This is the 24-hour uh, 20, uh, forecast temperature change verifying 21Z on the 8th of September by the e uh, European Center model. There's a 59, couple of uh, 59 degree Fahrenheit temperature drops in a 24 hour change. That's how impressive that cold air surge was that followed, that followed that. And I love this image. These are taken one day apart. This is the, the, the sky on fire, literally the day before. And then there's snow on the ground. It's 101 in Fort Collins. Uh, and the next day there's snow on the ground. Talk about changeable weather um, in there. All right. so. Say something about the CONUS extreme weather events and the wildfire impacts as we get towards the end here. Um, 
really hot in California. Look at these temperatures on the coast in the areas of one, above 100, 110, uh, and through here, 106, 102, 109, 117 um, in there. Very, very hot. Uh, heat and fire, where are the active wildfires? And you can see pretty much all throughout the northern and central parts of the state in the hills. And this is a remarkable pyrocumulus in there. Uh, Mono Lake is in the foreground in there, and you can see the outflow smoke hay edge edging through here. Uh, Pyrocumulonimbus with anvil, um, uh, remarkable picture, another view of it. And you would, you would think of looking down at a mass of thunderstorms going on, but you can see there's very little shear because the anvil's spreading out in both directions uh, in there in the, in the ridge. So what were some of the impacts in the poor air quality in here? Um, Here's a remarkable image while the flow was offshore. You can see the fires burning in Oregon. The flow was offshore, and then it would come in, come inland when it re-loops and through here, really, really thick smoke. So there's poor air quality up and down the West Coast. A day without sun, the Golden Gate Bridge in the red-orange, looking like the end of the world. I mean, look at that image of San Francisco. That's ridiculous. And the poor air quality three days later, um, off the charts, air, poor air quality, pretty much all, everywhere up and down the West Coast and parts of inland areas of Washington and Oregon. Acreage burned. Minute, okay, I'm almost done. Um, acreage burned a record in 2020. And an operational model forecast issue here, erroneous progressive flow. So I want to compare the GS-15, which was then operational, which was the GFS V-16, which was coming into play. So here's the 156 hour forecast, and here's verification in the lower right corner. The new GFS current operational there, the, the model at 156 hours could not get the trough to cut back into the mountains, and that's the difference field on the lower left, because it couldn't get the ridging right on the western coast. At 168 hours, you can see the, the newer model was even worse than the operational model in having a too progressive a trough compared to reality. 180 hour forecast was even worse. So it's the systematic bias of being too progressive in the, in, in the, with the, in the forecast. And that had a huge impact on what happened in the, uh, in the West. So the conclusions would be that the East Pack TC moisture fuel thunderstorms that initiated West Coast wildfires had missed a, a heat wave. Uh, West Pack ET events uh, resulted in Western North America Ridge and multiple Western Conus extreme weather events. Troughs cresting the ridge facilitated a cold surge that ended a record-breaking heat wave over the Great Basin and Rockies, which produced record-breaking low temperatures a couple days later. Anticyclogenesis behind the cold surge drove hot and dry, gusty downslope winds that further fueled the West Coast wildfires. And widespread wildfires resulted in massive smoke plumes that spread across much of the Conus and the North Atlantic. And the NCEP, uh models, a GF model, F, GFS models struggle to predict the large scale flow that drove multiple Western CONUS extreme weather events. I'm done. Thank you, Lance. It's really interesting. Any questions for Lance? So I had one, Lance, in terms of tropical variability, and Eric had mentioned this in terms of like the MJO's uh, teleconnection into the East Pacific and modulating the TC activity there. Right? During this event, was there a connection to the tropical waves? That, I don't know the answer to that question yet. Okay. What I do know is what I showed you. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that obviously is the next step. Right. Great. Um, Yeah, I don't see other questions, Lance, on the chat or the raised hand. So we, if there are other questions, they can be posted on Slack and then we can mention it to you for a response. Sure, I think everyone's tired and <laughs> I, not a lot of people like to look at weather maps these days. Oh. <laughs> no, it's great to yeah, bring in the, oh, Jan, Jan has a question. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, thanks for... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, thanks for this very interesting talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, you showed the, the prediction at the end, um, I think five or six days ahead of the cold air coming down from the north. Um, so you said that the ridge wasn't predicted well. Do you have an idea 
what where the errors are in um is it because well, of the it's related to the cycle? tc it all it all originates back to the tc's in the western pacific and the negative pv advection by the rotational wind um, due to die strong diabatic heating and ridge building and downstream barrack length development okay thanks We a follow up to that, Lance. In, in terms of uncertainty in prediction of the TCs, was there a large uncertainty in terms of like the cone of the ensemble spread um, for this? For the individual TCs? Yeah. That I don't, that's a good question, Anish. I don't know the, the answer to that question. Um, is, but the errors are growing um, rapidly downstream and they're related to the release of latent heat. Uh, which is manifest by the strength of the irrotational wind and the associated negative PV advection by the irrotational wind. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Jan, for the question again. And thank you again, Lance, for the really sure. interesting talk. Um, with that, we'll end today's um, session for the workshop. Thanks again to all the speakers, both morning and um, the second session. Speak.